Maxwell and Melbourne Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cochin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hey friends, you got MJ from the Coaches Panel. Welcome back to another episode of the 50 Most Relevant, where we look through who I think are the most relevant players for you to have a conversation about in 2023 for your Super Coach, Dream Team, and AFL Fantasy sides. Talking about Nick Dacos today, something. Why is he in the 50, MJ? The second year Blues are coming his way. Others are going, why is he in the 30s? And I think because there's such differing perspectives around him in the fantasy communities why he's landed exactly where he has in the 50 most relevant it's been a minute since we've had him on maybe a couple of minutes rids is back on this episode hello buddy how are you hey mate how you going oh good look nick's a fascinating player for us to talk about 20 years of age defender eligible and boy that was some debut season that he delivered for us last year wasn't it rids he was ridiculously good. And there was nothing that actually, like, like we all expected he was going to be good, yeah, MJ? Yes. We yeah. all expected him to be up. the money maker, the best making, like, the best average in rookie for the year and so on and so forth. We all expected it at the start mm. of last year. But the fact is, when you actually break the numbers down, especially in Supercoach and DT slash AF, you really start working out just how good a year it was. It's it's a season like we've we talk about these amazing, phenomenal first years, like a Sam Walsh and how good it was. And it was really good. A Toby Green back in the day. It was a great first year, and it was, but this season that um we've just got from Nick Dacos it ranks right up there amongst one of, if not the best, first seasons from a cash cow. If we look at some of the numbers of what he delivered for us last year, his top score last year, of course, it's going to be his career high scores, given he's only played one season of AFL football, but it was a 147 against the Adelaide Crows in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. I'll say that number again. For a dude that's only played 25 games of AFL, he's already hitting 145 plus scores in AF. In Supercoach, same game, 163 in Supercoach. Phenomenal. He's got an average for us of 86.7 in Fantasy and Dream Team and 91.2 in Supercoach. That format, just a touch over 500K in AFL Fantasy, $1,000 shy of $770,000, while he's just over $787,000 in DT. I don't know, Rids, if there is much more he could have done for us last year. From the money-making he delivered, to the ability to play every single game as a cow, the gaining of dual position status to be genuinely someone you could have held for the year at D6, yet comparable ceiling to some of the best defenders in the game. It's rare to say that a cow becomes a keeper, but you really could have done that in 2022 with Nick Dacos. The other thing he did, though, was he played a style of football that was really attractive to the eye. Mm. He was... And he stepped up in the big moments that yeah. Collingwood needed him to step up in. Like, it was always Nick Dacos that was set up or kicked that really important goal that turned the game, especially in their run to the finals last year. Yeah. Like, and then the way that he plays, though, that he was setting that um, whole attack up from that back line. It was just ridiculous how good it was from a football perspective, let alone mm. a fantasy perspective. But when we go into the fantasy world, which is obviously what we're doing today, yeah, that's right. when you go, a guy has averaged 91 in super coach. Yeah. You go, okay, no, that's beautiful. Like, and I'm talking about the home and away season, obviously. Mm. Um, that's an amazing year in his first year. But then oh, you go in and you actually look at the breakdowns and say super coach for now and you see the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, low 70s across the board in his first season. And you go, wow, wait, he averaged 90 something. So his floor of his scoring range was so low in certain mm. games. And this is what we expect in our rookie type season. Volatility like of scoring, players. yeah. Yeah. 
But if he just steps that up a fraction, wow, we the sky is the limit. And I can tell you another thing, MJ, his upper end, like his higher ceiling and scoring range mm. is such a ceiling range, but we only saw brief instances of it. So if he could actually get more of those to be generated through the season, Absolutely. wow, we this guy is going to be some sort of value add like from where he started from with those price tags this year. It, it's really true. If you want to look at some of these numbers in detail that Rids is highlighting so beautifully overall, that season in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team of 86.7 consisted of seven tons, three over 115, and that career high score of 147. Super coach that average of 91.2, six tons, four over 120, including a 143 and a 163. Um, and, and then you look at this season, often with a first-year player, they start out at their best, and as the year goes on, they start to slow. Well, with Nick Dacos, while he had some slow patches at the end of the year, no doubt, his seasonal splits indicate he only got better as the year went on an average of 80 in dream team and fantasy and 78 in super coach over the first 11 games last 11 games he goes a 93.6 in dream team and fantasy and a 102.8 and that's not just cherry picking numbers because Ritz four of his worst scores of the year in AFL fantasy and dream team came in the last four games of the year with one exception and that's exactly what we're highlighting is you know, it doesn't take much for those scores to just lift a little bit. Now, if this was uh, 50 most relevant in AF, this mm. guy's top five. Because yeah. I reckon he's almost the most selected defender across the board. He is right now. Like more than a rookie, dollars. Yeah. Like, the, and this is going to dictate your year, isn't it? Like, no matter how you look at this, if That's you right. think he's going to take that next step and go again, like, I mean, we often see with these rookies, you know, first year, the second year, the third year. I mean, how often have we heard third year breakout, fourth year breakout, and so on and yeah, so forth? Yeah. This guy had a first year breakout. Yeah, that's like, right. Like, if he takes the next step and you believe that, then you, it's a no-brainer to start him, isn't it? Because it's oh, going to be the lowest price point he's going to have. But he's also on the flip side, though. He's very well uh, to be taken on. Like, because yes. we've often talked about second year blues when it comes to rookies. We've talked about a more attention. Now, mm. at this point in time, I would argue if he's almost Collingwood's best player. The mm. most, I think that's fair. Is he going to be the most taggable, like, player? Like, is, are people going to, opposition to coaches going to be looking at, how do we stop Nick Dacos? Um, especially across half back. Does that mean, though, Collingwood's going to inject him in the midfield? Does that mean That's they're right. going to... In, you know, there's worlds around everywhere here. <laughs> there's questions flowing everywhere. So what a great discussion point. But if he was AF, he oh. would be top five, MJ. Well, right now, he I think he's got a 40% ownership in AFL Fantasy right now. At this point in time, it's the only format that's made ownership publicly revealed because it's the only format officially open. So that's in the top 10 of, of most owned players right now in AFL fantasy. I, I think you've done some really nice summaries. I'd love to drill into some of those kind of highlights and, and get your take on, on some of those things. Let, let's talk about this second year regression that is traditional trend. One of the things I love doing when I do the 50 most relevant, I know yourself both professionally and also in, in a fantasy space, love looking at trends in data and statistics and statistical trend normative is that first year solid scores, fantasy players show their potential in blips and moments. Second year, the traditional trend is a regression. We know playing AFL football takes a physical and mental toll. We know opposition sides start to figure you out. We know there's some positional volatility that can happen in certain sides. Third year and fourth year, these are the breakout seasons. And then fourth and fifth year are the establishment of what you're really going to be as players. There's no ever one size fits all. It's like getting to a university degree um, or getting to your dream job. There's multiple ways of getting there. But the traditional trend is regression in the second year. The good news is, I suppose, for those that are really bullish 
on going after Nick Dacos, here are some names that should give you some confidence. Nat Fife, Jackson McRae, Zach Merritt, Clayton Oliver, Tim Taranto, and to a lesser extent, Tim Kelly. These are all guys, again, he's a mature age player, so we, we probably shouldn't factor him in as detail because otherwise you've got a Michael Barlow to bring into the mix. These are guys who immediately deliver solid first years and turn into out-and-out premiums in their second season. They, they, these are only a handful of names. Now, there's some other selected data you might want to use, but the reason it's only a handful of guys over the past decade, Rids, is to follow up the first year and to become a premium, which is what you're picking him to be. There's no stepping stone value that you're really trying to get, although he is underpriced his potential, what we've seen. You're picking Dacos because you think he's going to become the next name on that Hall of Fame of second year premiums. Yeah, so the guy that I would be looking at um, if I was going to be starting to compare would be a Walsh, um, yeah, a Sam Walsh. Good. Because both of them sort of align the same sort of um, way. They pretty much walk into their team. They become almost the best or arguably the best player in the team straight away. They impact in round like season one straight so away. much. And they're both likely, like we saw with Walsh, he got a little bit more attention. He got a little bit more focus put on him in the second year. Yeah. Um, Slower and- start, but flew home at the end. Yeah, correct. But I think what tend, we tend to forget as well is that focus may even be just having more body applied, like to the the underdeveloped, um, not as developed midfield slash player yes. as what it is anyway, moving forward. So, and then it's sort of, you know, you've got bumps, you've got grinds, you've got, yeah. So whether it's someone that tags them or whether it's a team focus of actually applying that pressure, physical body contact to it across the board, it doesn't matter what it happens. No. But it's going to come down to, and this is how I always do it, MJ, and I've said this many, many times for many, many years now. I always still go with, do I love watching the guy play? Yeah. If I love watching the guy play and I'm sitting on the fence, I'm going to back him in and I'm yeah. going to start him. Like, and I, yeah, of course, there's going to be problems. Yeah. There's always anyone, depending on who you talk to at any point in time. Um, and it doesn't even matter if you know them or not these days, because <laughs> like with social media, everyone's going to share their opinion with you anyway. The thing is, no matter who you talk to, everyone's going to have an opinion or a problem or, or suit <laughs> that suits their agenda. You know yeah. what I mean? So, so MJ, if you are pro starting Nick Dacos and I'm against, I'm anti starting Nick Dacos, sure. you come to me along the journey and you ask for my opinion. I'm obviously already made my mind up that I'm anti starting. So I'm going to give you a more negative type of frame of mind. Correct. But if I come to you in reverse and ask you, then you're going to be more positive. So it doesn't matter who you talk to. It doesn't, it really just doesn't matter. So at the end of the day, it matters what you like. Yes. And I don't think there's any better way to play these formats than picking guys you absolutely love to watch. Yeah. I really well, don't. And, well, like, I mean, and he's so good at what he does. It Collingwood would look to get the ball in his hands at so often. And I think the Walsh contrast is bang on that. I, I do think some more attention will come his way at points this year, whether he moves from the midfield or not, it's irrelevant, but he's so smart. He's so good. He's so clean. He'll figure it out real fast, real quick. So yeah, there might be a couple of fifties and sixties there. We saw that with Walsh in the second year, but at that back half of the year, he started to show some premium tendencies for us. And as you know, I've been a little bit um, sidetracked with work and other things going on. Um, has there been a captaincy announcement been made at Collingwood? No, yet? not yet? yet. No, not yet. It's very heavily like linked to a, a Darcy Moore um, at this stage, but no official announcement yet. Yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't even discount the fact that, you know, a Nick Dacos is going to be right amongst the leading candidates for that because he of his football smarts that he has. And that might be putting a lot of pressure on a kid, but he is that good. And that name speaks volumes. So, 
So that's how high regard this kid is in, like held in. Like, I just think if you're going to be backing against, especially a kid, you yeah. don't want to be negative against the kid. No, no, you no, want no, him no. to come out and play and everything else. You want to be positive. Yeah, everyone's going to find a reason to pick or a reason not to pick, you know, across the journey. But at his price point, and this is why I'm sort of wondering, is he a start or is he an upgrade target? Now, yeah. for me, I think if you're big on him, you have to start him. Oh, have to I start just don't see, I just don't see enough, um, like, room for growth. I don't think I'd be jumping on him later. I don't see... Yeah. Because there is potential in your second year, you're going to slow down as the year goes on. But we Absolutely. didn't see that this year either. And no, he got Walsh, better in the first. Walsh got more and better as the second year went on as well. So... So it's a little bit hard to it's gonna be really confusing mid year when you're mm. sitting there going, is this the re to upgrade to Dacoff? Yeah. It's gonna be like, well, I don't know. And you're always gonna have that underlying no because you've already passed on him previously. Correct. But if you're if you start him, then I think that conversation is just not even required anymore. You just keep yeah. him for the year and at some stage, you he will come good at some stage. He, like, he will. It's all about the timing of when you get him. I think you're right. We, we've done that split of his season last year of the first 11 and the last 11. But if you only got into him in the last five, now you had a terrible season because he was the best cow of the year, but he only gave you an 85.6 in super coach. And in Dream Team and Fantasy, he only gave you a 77. And, and so that only further inflates how good he was in the middle portion of it there. But it, it's all about the timing. In terms of his role, uh, he's training with the defensive group this preseason. Read into that what you wish. That I, I think he'll keep getting moments in the midfield um, as he continues. I, I don't think they'll throw him completely into the deep end. They've added a Tom Mitchell to play some stoppage and, and some center clearance work through there. Uh, he, he'll be a slow build through there because what they might gain with moving Dacos into the midfield, they'll potentially lose of what he does to set up the play behind the ball for them as well. So I, I don't think it's critical for his scoring at either way, because uh, like a, someone like a Walsh, like a Merritt, they're so good. They're so clean. They're so smart. They'll just find a way to be near and around the football, no matter where they're positioned on the field. I kind of know about you as well. I sort of I trust McRae a little bit after yeah. year one. Yep. I sort of go, you know what? If he says something, if Fly says this, then I believe it. And yeah. I don't have any idea why. I really don't. It's probably more but the fact he, that he said things and he's followed through with them. Yeah, it's just like, and he didn't put any mayo on it, you know? Like, yeah, excellent. So if he's training with the defensive group, I think that's actually a positive. And I know that, you know, this time of year is crazy how people go looking for more midfield time or whatever else. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, the way that footy's been played these days, I think um, playing behind the ball is definitely not a negative at all. No. Uh, but I'm sure there'll be many out there that say, well, I think it is negative, you know. But again, that meets their agenda. So yeah, that's right. Nick Dacoff, year one, he averaged enough to be regarded a keeper for a season. Yes. Across the season. Don't care about patches. Don't care about it. Whatever. No. So what? Defenders are volatile at the best of time with their scoring anyway. Correct. We all know the rookies are volatile with their scoring. But the thing is, across the year, he did enough to be a keeper for the season at D6. You would yep. have been, you know, and I we, we sort of mentioned that with Sicily a couple of weeks ago as mm. well. Like he sort of did the same thing from a lower price point. Now, if you were to say to me, Sicily and Dacos ended up being year long keepers at D5, D6 across the format, well, guess what? That's two upgrades to premium that we would never have expected from Correct. day one of last preseason. 100%. So, but right now, though, I think he's well and truly to match what he did in year one, which means. He, it's going to be, it's going to be fine as a D six. 
option for the season. He's going to be around that mark. If you want to put him in terms of where he's ranked by his average, uh, he's the 25th best defender in Supercoach and the 17th best in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. That That's obviously there's some guys that I've been playing or won't play, like an Alex Witherden who's loaded into that. There's some DPPs that will gain, but I think you're right. He's a fascinating player to look at because whether or not you see the potential upside and you're jumping on where the high ownership is, He's relevant. If you're going to go against him because of the high ownership, because you think the second year blues will hit him, he's relevant. And that's the key reminder for us in the 50 is it is about relevance, not about scoring. It's all about a bunch of those different components and elements rolling through there. Where he goes on draft day reads is really fascinating to me. He's by average, he's probably placed as at a D3 spot in Supercoach and, and a D2 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. But I think if you're waiting for him to be a D3 in Supercoach, you're, you're probably going to not draft him. You'll be you'll be left red face going, oh, no, I missed out on him. In DT and AFL Fantasy formats, though, is reaching for him as a your first defender, your D1, too much of a stretch, given what you potentially are going over? Or is it all about a bunch of other different factors. We discussed this a couple of weeks ago as well around um, Sicily and Hall and these types, you know, the guys that have never been um, consistent enough to be taken so early on that you sure. would like. I think Dacos, if you, wanted, if you wanted to take the risk with an Aaron Hall, yes, I think Dacos is your perfect D1 and then get Aaron Hall in as a D2. Yeah, I like that. So that way then, Hall, if he plays, is obviously going to be your D1 in that instance. But you've yeah. always got that consistent, steady D1 who plays week in, week out. And yes, it's his second year. Like, I mean, it's very early days. But mm. like he's he, he doesn't give the impression to me that he's going to struggle at all with um, injuries or anything no. like that. Like, And they're playing him behind the ball who's, uh, to protect him a bit. So yep. I actually think... That's how I would do. I would draft him at your D one, but then get a Aaron Hall, who's really a D one when he plays for the season. Yeah, I like that in AFL fantasy and dream team formats. You're probably going too far in Super Coach with him as your D one, but you're answering the question about you know in a, in a DT and an AF format. So I, I think you're spot on. But um, Super Coach, I still don't think he's like. I mean, you have a look at his high points. Okay, now, his high yes, points are still as good as everyone else. Yes. Yeah, so he's he's still got scores of 140, 160 last year in Supercoach yeah, in his first year. He's got another season where he's spending all his preseason um, with the defensive group. Yeah. He's only going to get better and better. He's going to be the number one guy to take the ball out of the pie's you know, defensive line moving forward. Yeah. They've got guys like Tom Mitchell and a few others there now that really give them... Um, I wouldn't say um, I wouldn't say the high level depth, but they give them extra depth across yeah. the board. So that does mean that you have the potential to throw him in the midfield and yeah. actually be protected by a Tom Mitchell in the midfield at that point in time, which also means, and this is where it gets so creative right now. So I love the fact that they went and got Tom Mitchell because mm, it's great it means. Him. Well, a Dagoe can suddenly become your forward. A yeah. Jamie Elliott, when fit, may be injected in the midfield. But you do that all around the guys that are always there. You can throw a Pendlebury behind the ball. You know, yeah. however it works, it works. You can give Dacos moments of time in the midfield. And when he's going well, leave him there. Yeah. Because the fact is, like, they've got that real good mix right now. That's right. It's true. I like that. It's a good thought. Hey, mate, as always, an absolute pleasure to have you on these podcasts, giving us your take on Tom Mitchell. Easy as. Uh, and every other Collingwood player, Nick Dacos. We, we, we got a Collingwood pod towards the end there, which was lovely. I wonder if we'll see Tom Mitchell appear in the 50 most relevant. No, it's an interesting one. If you want to go and read the article on Nick Dacos, you can go and check that out. It is online now for you at coachespanel.tv. If you have not become a Patreon supporter yet, well, for a couple of bucks a month, that's all it takes. It helps us do everything we do with the podcast, the article, all the social media content. And we'll even kick you some exclusive 
exclusive access to a bunch of different things. All the details to become a Patreon, you can find that too at coachespanel.tv. Well, we take another step closer in the 50 most relevant. Tomorrow, we step into number 35. So, number 37 was Salem. Number 36 was Dacos. Feel like I'm in a nice run of defenders, Ritz. So I'm just going to keep plowing through another defender that people are looking at that they believe that could hit premium territories in 2023. Who is it? Don't tell them, Ritz. It's Griffin Logue. It's Griffin Logue. Oh, dang it. You're not meant to tell them. All right, Griffin Logue on the 50 most relevant tomorrow. Thanks, Ritz. You party people. Yeah.